Cool. So, Lucian, uh, myself, and my other co-hosts, we have this uh, weekly call where we talk about product development, about business, indie, bootstrapping, personal life, all kinds of things. And um, at one of these meetings, Lucian said, like, hey, guys, I published this thing here. And if you know Lucian, like, I published this thing here. Probably nobody's going to see it, but I just wanted to show it to you. And that thing was the short Ruby newsletter, which kind of became like the fastest growing newsletter, Ruby newsletter, actually. After more than a year, it's incredibly valuable. Um, if you don't know what it does, it, Lucian goes on Twitter and on Mastodon and on other sources and compiles whatever happened for uh, this week. So you get one edition for the past week, and it's incredible. You know how on Twitter everything is ephem ephemeral, uh, everything goes away, you read it and you forget it? Well, you can find it in his newsletter, so it's amazing. Um, cool, so I think he's the best person to speak about the state of the Rubyverse, so give it up for Lucian. Test. So hello. Uh, not, I mean, I'm still doing the newsletter for myself. So I, I, I I'm glad that you enjoyed. Uh, not sure I'm the exactly best that does this. Probably there are people with more experience than myself. I just want to to put the expectations a bit down. Okay, <laughs> for for this. Okay. So yeah. Uh, who am I? Uh, this is me. I look pretty the same. I always wear the same kind of cut. Uh, you can find me on some social media stuff, and that's my email there. Um, I will pass quickly through this. But I, I want to say something to, to set a bit the stage um, about, about what I'm going to present and just put a bit a kind of disclaimer or, or some kind of notes before, right? So the, the thing is that I, I'm, I'm compiling, I will show to you different kind of things that are happening and compiling, it's kind of a compilation of different categories, right? Um, and, and probably there are things that I missed. I mean, probably there it's a, it's a bit uh, an understatement. There are for sure things that I missed and there are probably things that maybe you know, and they should have been here, but I don't know, I did not put them, right? So, and, and, and this goes to the second thing, that this is not a top, or, or not, is not based on popularity or number of downloads or things like this. It's mostly things that, for me, excites me about what is happening in Rubyverse. So I, I try to put them here, so to, just to, in my mind to sparkle a conversation and see, okay, is there, like, what are some directions that, that we go, okay? Um, and, and third, just to make it very clear, it's, it's very subjective in a way, uh, and, and um, um, the only criteria that I put a bit, it was like, just, just to make sure that the projects, they have at least one commit this year, so that, that was basically my criteria for this. Um, and just stating about this that this does not mean that projects that did not have, they are not actively maintained. It might be that someone made a project that is in a way done. You know, so it does not mean need too much development. So it's not exactly a good criteria. Okay, in, in, I just want to state it. But I had to put something to, to restrict myself to, to a, a time box. And, and um, the the... Last thing about this, before going to, is that, two, actually two things. <laughs> I don't try to convince you to change something uh, or to say this is good or this is bad, so I, I will kind of refrain to say, to make judgment calls and, and to say this is better than this. I will just say this is doing this different, okay? Yeah, so uh, what I'm going to talk, um, I'm, I'm going to talk about rubies, uh, about web frameworks, this gems is a huge category that I just put some things that allows me to put different things there about developer experience and about uh, AI, AI, like artificial intelligence, large language models, machine learning, and all this stuff there, okay? So going into this, uh, first, the multiverse of rubies. And I'm, I'm going just to give a kind of definition about what I mean by rubies. It's not mine, I read it somewhere. But by rubies, I mean like a compiler or interpreter or a virtual machine or something that does something with the Ruby syntax in a way, right? So, so, but mostly I will focus on compilers, interpreters, and virtual machines. But th there is a whole world out there, uh, another universe, right? So before going this, let, let's do a bit of uh, interaction and just, just uh, let me ask you the following question. So um, raise your hands if you know at least one rubies or more. Right, 
Okay, so yeah, at least one. So now, who knows more than two rubies? Okay, and more than three? Okay, more than four? You can keep it up if you know, right? More than five? Okay, yeah, I see some. More than six? No, so, so, no, no, but this talk is not for you, right? It's, uh, you, you know them. <laughs> there was a person there. But uh, just, just trying to, to see where we are. I also, some of them did not knew, or at least before doing the Shore Ruby newsletter, I was not aware about those, but now they are coming to my attention. So, of course, we start with CRuby, right? And, and if you are working in web with Rails, I assume this is what you're mostly using, right? It's, it's the, when you enter Ruby Lang, um, uh, dot org, and you, if you press download, you go to that, or if you are using a, a version manager and you write there, I don't know, rubyenv install Ruby, so you use the word Ruby, or, or I don't know, ASDF or something, I use the word Ruby, you don't specify something else, you, you get this, which, which was originally or uh, initially named MRI, but, and now, now the term that we are mostly using, it's, it's uh, C Ruby because it's written in C. Here, just, just the short point, uh, yeah, we just had uh, this 3.3 uh, uh, preview release, which, which adds some things. I, I'm, my plan here is not to go into each things that I will put here. I'm just using the slides to, to show something, but I'm just saying that we, we are moving, of course, faster with this. There are some things happening in the performance, not only in 3.3, but since Mats announced the, the Ruby 3x3, three three, we, we kind of have a lot of uh, development in this area, right? Um, and, and before showing you uh, something a bit more uh, that is happening, I, my sense is that we are evolving, right? It, things are happening in the universe. And I'm, I'm going to do a bit of tangent talking about something that is dear to me, and that, that is talking a bit about, because I'm going to show you some code here that my, you might agree or disagree with. So the purpose is not to convince you, but the idea is I'm, I'm passionate a bit about adopting new things. So here I, I'm going to... Uh, deliver a small speech about why adopt a new feature, right? A new language feature or, I don't know, new library, new, new feature that appears, right? So, so in a way, it, it was already some, some points were touched here <laughs> to, today, but in a way, at least for me, this is my experience, right? In the, in the beginning, I, I learned Ruby, I think, in, in 2007. One of the person that teach me is, is in the room. So, yeah. Uh, so in the beginning, Ruby looked kind of strange, right? This is how I felt. It made people uncomfortable, right? Uh, and while reading the syntax, you know, it challenged how we write code. And, and this, for me, created emotion. And you can still see this kind of emotion where people are talking, race does not scale, Ruby does not scale, right? And you see that the comments are very against, right? So. Just remembering something from Irina yesterday, that's emotion, right? It does not mean the labor, but it's a kind of emotion in that, okay? And, and, and yeah, also some other people acknowledge that. You also saw this today, right? <laughs> so people were saying this. Um, Linus Torvalds, it's uh, the person, right? And, and the thing about adopting the, the new feature is that if we think about language and how we see the world, right, we know, kind of know this in different sayings that the words shape our thinking and our reality, right? And, and th this, is, this is true if you think about when you learn a new language, you speak a new language, right? As, as you get better with new words, syntax, uh, the, the cultural uh, phrases that people are using, the better you can express your, your thoughts, your ideas in, in that language, right? Is this true for you? Does it make sense, right? Okay. So I, for me, the same, I think it, it is happening in programming, right? When you learn um, either a new programming language or different features of a programming language, right? What are we doing? We are basically transferring or modeling a kind of universe, the reality and the requirements, into a kind of another universe with a limited set or limited rules, right? So we make a translation between these two in a way, okay? So in, in my idea is that Programming language features, so the more we know about the language, right, shape the way we think about the problem and, and shape the way we think about the solution and in the end shape the way we code, the code we write, right? So the, the more idea is that the more you know about the feature set and you try to use it in general, I'm saying in general, right, the, the better you can express your solution and the better is what we're talking in Ruby like idiomatic code, right? It's, we, we, we go there. So, 
I'm going to show you just since, since oh, before going there, since Ruby 2.7, but also before, but I'm, since Ruby 2.7, there are quite few new features in the language. Okay, this is my sense of, of this. And looking a bit in, in the open source world, in general, or some companies that, with whom I'm working, I s not, they are not quite adopted. Even the, we have Rubocop rules to disable them, right? The, you, you can search for it, and they say, don't use that, don't use that. And the same could be about a web framework and so on. We, we kind of, and in a way, I don't judge that. I think, in a way, that shows a kind of maturity we want stable, major products, right? But I'm just trying to, to pitch this idea that we should try to use them, because if we don't use them, how can you create better rules for them, right? So, just showing some, some small things here. The latest among many things is data class, that's an immutable, you can create an immutable pro object. I'm not going to read the code, I'm putting code here, but it will be very long to explain everything, but basically it's, it seems pretty similar with struct, right? But it's immutable, you cannot change it, it throws an error, it does not have setters, even if you try instance variable set, it does not work, okay? You can still put a hash inside and change the hash keys, that still works, right, if you want, but in general we have this, right? And then, other thing, and this is the one that, among the, the second one, that, that sparkles, in my opinion, the, the most emotion against. And that is hash literal omission, right? And what, the, what do I mean by this? Uh, sorry, going here. Just uh, the, the quick here is, this, this also, also works for uh, uh, keyword parameters in methods, right? So the quick here, just to make sure that, the, oh, sorry, everybody knows this? So that I don't explain something that you know. Okay, but there are a few, okay, just saying very quickly, it's like if you have a key and then you have uh, a variable with the same name, you don't have to specify it, right? And it will create it, just very, very shortly, right? And I don't know, uh, who is using this in their current code base now? Okay, I'm so glad to see, right? It's experimenting with it, right? Endless method. Another one that we, uh, th there is quite a debate about it, right? It's like one line method. Here, of course, I push it a bit. It's endless method and hash omission, right? <laughs> Pushing it a bit. Um, so yeah, again, no judging. If you don't use it or you're using it, that, that's fine. I'm just trying to show that it, the language is evolving in different ways, right? And another one, and I, in my opinion, I think this one will actually might have the option to change more the way we write Ruby code. And here I'm just showing you this pattern matching, I'm just showing you one or two syntaxes of it or ways to use it, but there are uh, more ways, right? And again, here also, I'm still using the hash literal omission, uh, right, uh, thing. Um, but here you see, like, the, this is pattern matching, um, a list of objects, then, the, for example, here, um, I match type, but then it, in, it will instantiate name out of this name, right? And I have it hidden in a variable, and then if the age is between those, I have it here, right? It's, it's a very simple case. You can do more complicated and uh, more nicer, maybe, or I don't know, more golf coding with it, right? And here is just the same thing, but in an if, but there are more things like this. I, I just put a very short example. And then, still in Ruby, uh, in the last years, right, we have focus on speed. And I will show here a bit of this, and then there, there will be more there. So, yeah, it was the, the yet another just-in-time compiler um, that was released, and here is uh, the, the Shopify um, CEO um, showing what the, the increase in this. And here is from this course, and just today here is uh, running Ruby 3.3 with, um, with uh, the just-in-time compiler. And of course now there is the Rust just-in-time compiler, which, which is experimental. It's, it's not production, right? It's there just experimental, but maybe people will do experimental things with it, right? But just showing that, okay, th there is a kind of uh, evolving this. I will not go into all the features that we have since Ruby 2.7 to now. This is just a tiny bit of it, but there, there are more, okay? So going more, CRuby was one of the rubies, right? And now what, what else is there? Full stack Ruby, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, Another, um, this, another of one of these rubies created by the author of Passenger, which, which has by default focuses on memory uh, optimizations, and the, they say it's ready for production, and uh, it's open source, and you, you can use it, right? It's, it's, it's for web. Then, it, it, 
um, it, it was, you see, you saw it today, then we have JRuby, like Ruby specs, you write Ruby, but it runs on Java virtual machine. It does not have the global interpreter lock. It, they say they have true parallelism uh, and, and concurrency, and of course it has a, a, a nice way to interact with Ruby, with Java code and, and the, the reverse. Um, and then there is Truffle Ruby, which runs on Graal virtual machine, right? Which, which is among the fast, they say it's among the fastest Ruby um, interpretation out there, interpreter implementation, sorry, out there. And it, 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 again, it does not have the, the global interpreter lock and it focuses on parallelism. And what's not here, it has some bindings with some other things. And what's not here is that a part of Truffle Ruby is written in, in Ruby syntax. Right, so, so, so and, and there are some talks about this, about how it optimizes running Ruby code. Um, not a big part, a part of it. Uh, okay. Um, and, then, and then there is uh, um, MRuby, right? Um, uh, that, that, that's uh, an implementation of the part of the Ruby specs that with the purpose to run uh, in embedded or to, to deploy it inside your app. Right, so it, it, it kind of has the Ruby tree syntax, but not everything. I think pattern matching is not there and some, some other stuff, but you write Ruby code. I mean, it's, it's still Ruby, right? Um, and in here I was a bit curious because that, that's quite big, and I was a bit curious what, what people are doing with it, and I found a, a GitHub issue uh, that worked well. <laughs> it loaded well. <laughs> I'm just, uh, so, so for example, someone did this open source graphical user interface uh, for audio plugins with it. Someone else did a simulation about some kind of forces in a platform with, with, with this that they deploy. Someone else was doing uh, this uh, anal data analysis program to run scripting and mathematical formulas for these enzymes and electric electrochemical kinest kinetics, right? Uh, someone put it in a point of sale in the POS, right? And you can also see it in a robot arm here. Okay. And, and this is just what I found, but uh, the, the, there is more out there. So this is here just to show that we can do with Ruby more than web, right? And, and I think last week I, I watched Matt's presentation uh, at Euroco, and he, he said that Ruby was not originally intended for running web apps. I don't know if you, if you saw the presentation, but it was kind of interesting um, that I, when I was preparing this, right? And we have more based on MRuby. So for example, Dragon, uh, Dragon Ruby Toolkit, which, which you, with, with, with which you can create uh, games, it's based on MRI, uh, sorry, MRuby, right? Um, and in this direction, there is also Pico Ruby, which, which is a, uh, implementing an alternative MRuby that is focusing in, in having a small footprint and, and uh, as you see here, running on one microchip controller. And I think also at Euroco, but uh, I also see it online, the author, for example, used this to, to program the, I think it, it was Raspberry Pi Zero, if I, I was not at Euroco, but I think it was Raspberry Pi Zero running on it, right? And you can see the project, like you can go and, and, and check the project. Uh, and then there is, and now I will try to pronounce it, this artichoke, artichoke, artichoke um, which, which is uh, uh, trying to implement, to run Ruby on WebAssembly. And it, it's still very early stage, but, but that's the purpose of it. And of course, if you are passionate about this, uh, you can contribute to all of them, all are open source. For this, I, I could find only this one thing where they run it on a Steam Deck somewhere, uh, but, but I think it's a nice development, right? And, and then there is Opal, um, which, which, which is a like, source-to-source -source compiler from, from Ruby to JavaScript, okay? And, and again, reminding you of what I said in the beginning, probably there are more, right? The, and there were more, some of them are not maintained, some of them are probably now starting, but there is a whole world out there of Ruby specs implementations and what you can do with them, right? So now let's go to the second part that I want to, to, to talk about, and that's the multiverse of web framework. So let's do it again, the show of hands, who of you know more than one web framework? Right. Then keep it there if you know more than two. If not, let it down. More than three? Four? Five? Six? 
Seven. Again, the people who are, who after five or six are, are having the handout, probably you know more than me, so maybe we talk in the breaks, right? I will try to present what I know here a bit. Yes, about this. Um, so, of course, there, there is Ruby on Rails, right? So, the, the, you, I'm, I'm starting with it, right? And, and here I'm, I'm not going to go into details of Ruby on Rails, not because it's not big or not used or not new, but because you have a wide range of uh, newsletters and blog articles showing you what's new here. But I'm just going to to put some things here uh, in the last weeks, I don't know. We, of course, in the last years, year, year and so, we have the hot wire, right, which, which brings a new perspective in how we are creating web applications. And, and also, just pinpointing here that it's, this specifically is also adopted, I saw, by other programming languages, like I saw someone from PHP and so, some other places implementing it. Right, um, and, and of course we had the beta release, but actually this is a quite old because I saw, I think, today, but I could not put it like a release candidate. Um, I think it's probably, or yesterday, right? Could not update it yet, I forgot, but uh, it's new, there is something newer than this, right? And, but it has, it has it, it's quite an advancement, and here is just, uh, there are just few things, but it generates Docker file, or if, of course, if you're already running on master, you have this, right? Um, and it's bring yourself your own authentication and uh, asking queries, in, and, and then we had in the last two weeks the, the ban, adding support for ban, and there, there is more in this. I don't go into it. I, I just could not fail to just put race and move on, it's, so just to put things here, right? And then, um, what I think it's, it's interesting also this year is that we had the release of Hanami 2 after a very long period of time where Hanami did not have a, a, a release. And Hanami, uh, it's a web framework that, that focuses on making a simpler structure and being fast. Uh, of course, about each of these frameworks, there, there is a while, I mean, we could talk for a, like an workshop about them, right? But, but I'm just uh, pinpointing some stuff and uh, it's used, there are some, quite a few companies using it, and uh, they're working on Hana, Hanami 2.1 release, and uh, re already, I think already it's shipped support for views, and they're working for, for the asset pipeline, and there is a GitHub project where you can see live what is happening there, okay? And, and it, it looks like this. this I, I just needed to, for the newsletter, I'm using Substack, they, they publish a very weird RSS filter. I try as a, as a funny exercise to implement a filtering on top of RSS filter in Hanami, right? And this, this is just a valid code. And you can see here that it, it, it has some concepts like uh, the, the actions or methods that you see in Rails are, are objects on their own, and it has an automatic uh, dependency injection, which maybe if you are using the, the whole suite of dry gems, you, you probably are aware of this. And, and yeah, it's, it's a whole new, a different, a bit of different way to write web apps, right? Um, and it, like Rails has a Rails API, Hanami also has a Hanami API, which all the stats which I will put here, another disclaimer, are not, I did not run them, so I go, on the project, and if they, they have some benchmarks there, I, I put them here, so don't judge this, right? But, but they say it's, comparing with this one is the fastest, okay? Uh, the, the Hanami API, right? And uh, it, for example, this is, this is uh, how it looks um, in, in uh, trying to stream a response with this API, so you, it, it kind of may be similar with Sinatra, so it's a D DSL, um, and it's simple, it does not, the, do too much because this is why it's faster in a way, right? And of course, I, I assume that among the people who <laughs> raise their hands, you know Sinatra, right? It's a, it's, it, it, it has a beautiful DSL. It's all, uh, seems like a lot of companies are using it in, in various ways. Um, and w w why I put this here is that I, watching the, the changelog, they had some smaller releases uh, over the, I think, a couple of years. And this year they had a bigger one where, where you can see new in, in, in the description, right? So, so and, but also Sinatra could be kind of the, an example of a project that maybe is mostly done, so it does not need too much because it, it does not want to do too much, right? So, so, and it looks like this, it's, you have the verb and then the root and then respond with something. Right? And it does not have an opinion where to put the code. You can put this, you name the file however you want to, you, you, you put the code there, right? Now, if you want to 
Well, an opinion where to put the code. Someone wrote Padrino, which, which has an opinion where and how to put the code, right? Or which runs on top of Sinatra. And it kind of looked like this. So, so the, the actual routes or the actual request, it's rooted like this. But then you have controllers, and then you have this namespace, and then you can have some configurations and, and so on, right? So that's Padrino. And then going a bit more into, into uh, different kind of frameworks in this, in this idea that a framework that you can compose, so uh, you, you don't have to adopt anything. There is Roda, um, which, which, which has a, let's go to, uh, has, it's focused on supporting, a, a, let's say, a complex way to express roots. And it starts from there. Right? You, you can do roots in, a, in more complex ways. And you can see some bit of code here. Again, I, I'm not going to read all of them because it takes a, a while. But I just put it here because at least me as a programmer, I like to see code even if you don't speak too much about it. But hey, how does this look like? You know, it, it looks like this. And, and uh, Jeremy uh, has a benchmark, this R10K, which is open source. It's on GitHub. And he runs it. And here is, for example, an example that he says about running. OK, like, like seems to be faster. Um, and it's used in some applications. And I, for example, watch this Karafka. And it and, and seems like not only you can code, uh, like do your own web app in it, but uh, it, it also fits nicely if you have a gem and you want to make a small dashboard because it has a smaller footprint and it's fast. Um, or at least this, this, this is a case that I, I discovered, right? And then, um, interesting to see, in, at least in my experience, there is Bridgetown. Uh, and Bridgetown started as a fork of Jekyll. Um, so it's a static website generator. But they added support for server-side rendering, so like a web framework with Roda. So they included this, the, you can include this. And then you see that the roots are very similar, but yeah, you're in Bridgetown, so you, you can you can make it more responsive, or I don't know, more, go more to web apps. So that could be something, right? And then there is, I, I, will, I have a bit more <laughs> of this, right? <laughs> Grape, right? Uh, so Grape, it's a, it's a REST API framework that you can, if you put it in a rack, uh, so you put a rack file, a config RU, and so on, you can run it by itself, but you can also add it in other web frameworks. And, and, and it's the, the purpose of it is to provide to you out of the box with at least some things that most of the time, either we want them or we will want them after the API grows, like versioning, different formats, and, and so on, right? So, so and it has this embedded so that you don't have to write it yourself, the support for it, right? And, and there are some companies using it that I found there. And then if you ask about bigger companies, so GitLab is using it. I opened their open source repo to, to check it. The others, some others I could not find exactly, but yeah, so, so it's used, right? Uh, and then on the fun side, um, there is Camping, which, which was a web framework created by Y, which I'm not sure if you know, no, anyone knows about Y? Yeah. So yeah, it's a, a fun web framework that was created with, an, with one main idea to, to run a web framework in one single file and have it model view controller. Right, so, so, and there are people who picked this up because it was not maintained for a while and they are, they are um, making it work, right? So if you uh, wonder about how, okay, how the code looks like, it's, it, it's, it's, it's experimenting, you know, like uh, I like that camping goes and you, you can put here something, right? So you can go camping or, yeah, so, so it's like you, you write it like this and you see that you, it has integrated, I think it's called MarkB or MarkB, um, a way to write the HTML using Ruby code, okay, inside. Yeah, and there is Cuba, uh, which, which is in the, in the same area a bit with a micro framework, right? And, and, okay, this is a screenshot. I did not check exactly around this, but it's from there. They, the, the main, let's say, uh, thing that I saw about Cuba is that they say they have a very small uh, code base, right? A very, very few lines of code to run it, okay? And, of course, it, it looks like this, and in my, at least in my opinion, it's, it, and even in their presentation, they, they drew a parallel with Sinatra, right? Because if you remove the on, you, you have get, right? And you put this there, so. But the idea is that it's, it's a very simple framework having some nice things to do, so yeah, something like this. And, and then going a bit more into this area of serverless, right? We have Ruby on Jets, 
which, which plans to, write, to run Ruby, and actually I think you can run Rails with it on AWS, because here is an example of a controller in this, so it's like, it, it, you can run probably Rails with it with some restrictions, right? Um, so the idea with this, just to summarize, was not again to say that one is good or better or to change something, but it's just there, are, there is a world world out there, right? There are various things. So maybe you want to experiment with some of them when you're doing a small thing and see how it is, right? And of course, it's a bigger talk, so um, um, oh, in a bug, this is how the, this slide should have looked like. There is a, maybe new or old words that we are coming through, right? So first, there are words outside the web, if we're talking about web framework. So we have a newer project that is called Scarpe, and that tries to run shoes. And shoes it's a, was a, um, a project that, that the, with the purpose to create graphical user interfaces, or let's say desktop apps, created by the same guy, Y. Right, with, which, uh, which, with a nice user interface, and, and uh, if you want to read something fun, I invite you to search about by a book that you can find it on, on GitHub or on web that is called Nobody Knows Shoes, and it's a nice combination of technical and drawings and uh, a nice way. But anyhow, um, th there is a team now. This is work in progress that does not upgrade the, the shoes, but rewrites writes a new engine to to be able to run the DSL. Okay. And, and I asked them on Discord, and here is a, an example of how you can write it, and it, here is a, 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 this is a window, right, on, on the desktop. And this is in development, uh, but I found it interesting. And of course, on, if you really want to write, let's say, production web app, desktop apps, right, there, there is Glimmer, which is, which is a, actually a collection of many gems that, allow, that helps you write desktop applications. Um, and it, it, it has its own kind of DSL way to specify things, and here is, for example, a code that I managed to make it run this, right, display this. It's from their documentation, I mean, I did not create it. So still creating a desktop application with this. Um, and then talking a bit what's outside the web and going into some other direction, there is, for example, Ronin, which is a kind of new security toolkit that, that you can use if you are doing security research. So it's a collection of uh, knowledge, let's say, run runnable code that you can use to, to do security research. And I take from, uh, again, as an example from them that here is, a, it's scriptable, right? So you can compose, the, you can run it as command line interface, but you can also compose it in your own scripts to, to automate stuff with it. And it's created by postmodern, modern, postmodern, um, the, the guy who, who does, I think, Ruby install, I think, or Ruby build, so it, I, it's a quite quality code. And then, if, if you either are subscribed to my newsletter or, I don't know, reading things online, you saw that there is quite a big chat about Rails and SQLite, right? Uh, it, it's, it's something in the works, uh, in a way. So, I, in, my, in my opinion, it started a bit a while ago with this uh, gem that is called Lightstack, which, which allows you to run Rails uh, where you have the database as SQLite, but you also run the jobs in SQLite and also the cache, and it, it, it's supposed to be fast. They, they have some benchmarks here. Here, I, I will not go read them, but uh, basically it's the top in read, write, and cache. Okay, basically. And, and it, there is, a, there is a, an effort out of this, which I put here because I think it's it, seeing the effort going live. So Steven, it's writing a lot of articles. It's not only him, but I just put some screenshots here, right? I don't want to say that that's the only effort, right? And, and, and also contributing a lot. And also it might be that, that once, like Basecamp will run once maybe on this in production, right? So it, uh, what is this about is, SQLite, we have it in development, right? You, you, if you don't put something, you, you have it there. But this is about, is this production ready? And there is a work to make it, let's say, parity-wise with the other adapters, at least for main cases, okay? And of course, this was here, so I'm not going into details, but it needs to be here, right? Uh, Turbo Native and, and, and the last, uh, uh, piece of the puzzle added there, right, Strad? I will not go into it because I think you saw a presentation already about this, right? 
Um, what else is there? There is, there is a lot of work, and here I will only pick two things, but the, the, the effort is bigger than what I'm putting here, but I just had to choose some things that are simpler to communicate, okay? But there is quite a bit of work to run things in parallel. I'm talking here about threads, concurrency, and it's a uh, wide range of this. But two things that, that I think you can directly use. One is the async gen gem. I think it's created by Samuel w Williams. Um, so, so it has a nice syntax, and, and you, you, you can run concurrent uh, input-output tasks, and, and it, 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 you see here that it has thousands of clients per process, so it's, it's quite fast, that, and the, the API to work with it, it it's very nice. And, and, but also in Ruby itself, since 3.0, we have as experimental feature the Raptors, right? Which, which is like an actor model abstraction, right? To write things in parallel. And I think this will actually help more libraries, right? To, to, to be able to run like this. And there is also, I think, effort to, in, in active recall to, to make it run in, in parallel, probably with this. But uh, here I'm a bit, uh, I did not read everything, but this is what I, what I understand. So, so this, this is very exciting that this is happening, right? And going from one direction to another direction, um, and, and starting a bit with a story, uh, I don't know if you know him uh, or not, or, but I will just share a personal story. Like when I, when I learned Ruby, I was programming in Python, and I transitioned to Ruby, and I'm using Vim. Um, and and Tipop, uh, you, you'll see a lot of plugins that start with Tipop slash, right? Uh, he wrote, or the, or the, is that my experience, I used a lot of his plugins for Rails and Ruby, right? And then I will share a bit of a history that maybe is not exactly history in the sense that one thing was after the other, but what did you have in the developer experience? I think, I mean, in my case, it was Vim, and then, uh, Somehow, uh, parallel with this, or maybe in the same period, it was TextMate or immediately afterwards, right? Um, and then we had Sublime, right? Which is, uh, uh, most of them are still here, right? But I'm saying about what uh, appeared new, right? And it, again, it's not linear, but I'm putting them like this, right? Sublime. Um, and then there was Atom, which, which was a kind of another way to look at how to code, right? And then out of that, we have Visual Studio Code and, and the range of this. And of course, parallel with this, there, is, there was RubyMine, which they integrate their own thing there, right? And, and in, in my opinion, again, subjective, is that we had some, I mean, I, this is how I see it, some nice things in the coding when I discover Ruby. And then, yeah, we had editors that were helping us in some ways, but I felt that the period we were not how to say, um, having many new ways that other, maybe other languages were having in terms of developer experience. And, and I see in the last period uh, things that I think we are in an era where there is more focus on the developer experience side. I'm not saying that was, what was before is bad, I'm just saying that I think we needed more, right? And now more is happening, even though some of them are in the early stages, right? So we, we have debug, and probably if you're coding for a while, you use buy bug or some, some other gems, which are, are good, right? But uh, then, the, then we have the debug gem that, that's supposed to support remote debugging with multiple front ends, right? Um, and, and there is already for Visual Studio Code uh, an extension that you can directly use. And then there is uh, IRB that now it's trying to match some commands that you found in some other gems, but integrated directly there, right? I'm not saying they, these are better or worse than the others, but it, there is development there happening, right? Directly here. Um, and then one that I think will also again help developing other tools, it's Syntax3, which, which is kind of, I watch Kevin Newton talked to make sure I understand exactly <laughs> what this is, uh, because it's, it's a quite complex. So it's, it's like an object layer representing the parsing output of Ruby code that represented as kind of trees. So on top of this, also it supports itself, but on top of this, it makes the job to write formatters, linters, different kind of parsers that do something with the code easier. And already there, are, there is an integration that you can do using syntax tree as the parser layer of Rubocop, for example. And, and I think this will trigger more tools that could improve our developer experience, if you want to. It's also fine. Sometimes I'm also opening Vim without any plugin and just put something there. So uh, it's, a, it's a wild range. But for someone that comes new to Ruby from some other language, I think these things 
are helping someone that comes into the language be more close to the, the experience from other places, right? And I think the one that truly makes the experience in the now is Ruby LSP that, that comes from Shopify, I think. Right, which, which you already have, it you can integrate it in Visual Studio Code and it runs quite of nice and it's not, it's not complete, the, there is still working in progress in it, but I think it makes the experience that we had before searching multiple uh, extensions and see what extension with what extensions is working and which language server and is solar graph crashing or not and what is happening there, right? so install this and you kind of have a basic IDE running in a way. Right. So yeah, and, and probably there are more. And and then I talk quite a lot. I will try to rush a bit uh, about this. So then then there are views. And I, here I will not. I, I I did not put what we already have. And I know we have debates in different ways that uh, either using ARB or I don't partials or and we have V components. And Nick presented yesterday Trailblazer. I put here only two things because I was thinking that it's close to the end of the talk after looking at the number of slides, right? But I put here two things that I think, I mean, they are new and I'm not sure if you'll use them or not, but for me, it kind of presents or proposes a new way to write views, even though maybe they work or not, but I found it interesting. Uh, and one is Plex, um, which, which for in my mind, is similar with what we saw in, in, in camping with Mark B. So it's writing Ruby code uh, that generates HTML in a way, right? So that could be something. And then there is someone, uh, and you can integrate it in Rails if you want. You can adopt it partially or totally. I, I just put here some code that you can run totally with it if you want. And then there is someone who to try to do that. You saw this thing in some other frameworks that you, you have here Rails, but then you, someone tr created this super view um, gem that you, you have the action as a class, and then you can write directly here the HTML. I'm not saying you should change it or not, again, but just proposing to see some new code, right? It's, sometimes these projects are, are adopted, sometimes we learn something from them. Right, it's, it's, it improves our experience with the language. And shortly, authentication, which uh, is a big thing, you saw it already in Rails, but hey, we had device for uh, quite a while, device did not adopt it in a way, Hotwire and Rails 7, and all of us were watching videos or articles, tutorials, how to put an initializer or something to make it work or disable Turbo or things like this, right? So this year, I saw more activity on that uh, on, on the GitHub with this release and, and also on, on posts on social media about people working here that they, they resume work and seems like it's, it's in a development state, right? Because I think it was a bit, we are a bit concerned, right? It's what is happening with device. And, and of course, I will not go into device. It's full feature. It has a plugins that you can probably achieve almost anything that you want with it. But what's new here, right? It's Rails 7.1 comes with bring your own authentication. It had some things in place before that. So now it has a nicer API with authenticated by that helps you navigate timing attacks, I think, because, because it runs the same, um, it takes the same amount of time when you're checking for something that exists or not. And then there are updates to, to have secure password that it changes only if you provide the previous current, like, the, sorry, the previous correct password. Uh, and then it has this normalized that you can run things before adding. I put it here, although maybe it's not directly about authentication, but you can, you know, when you want, you are writing before save or before validate to transform something, I don't know, do a strip or do things with the input before putting it to database. Now you, you have an interface for that. And then in this space, there are more new things. One is RODA authentication, which is a, which is a, a framework that you can integrate with Rails. There is a road authentication Rails plugin, and it comes full featured full, full featured with with um, all essential features, a lot of security features, multi-factor authentication, and a, a quite nice uh, sorry, um, a quite nice I, I would say configuration in one file. And yeah, I know that when you look at this, yes, indeed, it starts Roda inside Rails if you put it in Rails, right? But uh, they say it's fast enough for that. And there is an active development and an active writing articles about it. So it, it might make sense. And there is also, there are, there are more gems, but just presenting some ways, right? There is this authentication zero, which, which the purpose of this is that it's actually a generator that will generate the code for you. You don't require it or inherit, do inheritance or composition with some code from a gem. It generates the code, you have it in your 
up, you commit it, and that's, that's the code there, okay? And it's configurable, and you can say what you want to achieve there. And of course, there is a, a wide range of, uh, of um, I don't know, no, passwordless. And yeah, I forgot the slide. This is, should be the slide here. I was just changing them during the lunch <laughs> to put some thing. So, so um, sorry about this. So about this, uh, here we have OpenAI. So I will just pick some gems here. There is still development in this, but there is this gem called OpenAI, which is a nice interface to chat GPT, uh, OpenAI, right? The, then, then we have long chain in active development that's supposed to provide you a kind of level of abstraction to different kind of large language models and, and storages for this kind of tasks, right? And you see some code here. I will move a bit faster. And then Jason talked a bit about this. So there, there is something like AI Refactor, which, which is kind of something like you, you create a kind of YAML file that, for example, this is an example with respect to Minitest. And you write it inside your uh, Rails code, and you, it will transform it. Uh, you, you can put some context, and you, it will create a new file with the output transformed from that to this. Okay? And it's, it's an active development, very early stage. But I think it's a representative of a suite of tools that I think also Jason presented, right? A, a new uh, range of tools. Not sure if this will be a tool or some other tool, but for me, it's representative of what can be achieved. So you install it in your race. It's aware about your race files, and it has some kind of recipes about what you can run, right? Um, yeah, I, here and just finishing a bit. This um, we have. This is just an example. Neighbor. It's a. Um, it, you can use it with with uh, Rails, and it it. Creates, it adds support for em, storing embeddings and then s doing vector search via embeddings, right? Um, and you can also use it out of Rails if you want. Uh, you, you will need to use PG Vector Ruby um, to install it and, and uh, run with it. And just mention this, uh, Andrew Kane is creating a lot of gems in this direction, a very nice one if you, if you want more. I just put one because it will be a wide range of this kind of focus be, well working gems, right? And I will close now. <laughs> uh, sorry for this. So the, the thing is there, is, there is so much more there. D this is just some things that I put and still I took a lot of time with going through them without explaining each one, the differences, right? So here is, here is what I, I would like us to do, because here we are, in a way, forming new connection and, and talking between each other. So I invite you to do your own presentation about the state of Ruby. I, I'm pretty sure all of you are aware about things happening. And again, I did not put here things that are working well, and they are, we are using them, and we don't, they are mostly done, they are working as expected, which are great projects, also those, and should be in a presentation, right? I mean, they should be there. I just put some things to stretch, right? But I invite you to do your own presentation when you are, I don't know, traveling back or something, just open a markdown file or text file or something, and just write, what are the things that I know happening in Ruby right now, right? And, and then, of course, share it with the world and then maybe send it to me because I'm, I will try to transform this presentation into a kind of website or somewhere, put it somewhere to navigate these kind of things. I will for sure quote you, I'm trying to do that always in my newsletter, but I'm sure each one of you probably has a different kind of slice of the world, of the Rubyverse. Yeah, so that was my presentation. Thank you very much. I hope you're doing it.